everybody, I want to talk about Zelda. I like Zelda, if you haven't noticed. And when talking Zelda, it's hard not to mention what many consider to be the series' pivotal factor, the dungeons. Dungeons are almost as synonymous with Zelda as key phrases like exploration and have been a series staple since the very original. I doubt I need to explain how important to the series they are. I've been doing quite a lot of reminiscing lately, and one game's dungeons keep standing out to me as such a turning point for the series. I'm just gonna go ahead and gush about Ocarina of Time for a while. Now in today's video, I just want to start at the beginning and talk about the game's first dungeon. But before we dive into that, a bit more on why I chose to start here with Ocarina of Time. Do not get me wrong, the first four games in this series had some really great dungeon design, but there's something about the shift in level design from 2D to 3D that I think was really important for the series. In the original quartet of Zeldas, graphically and thematically speaking, there wasn't as much depth to the dungeons from what I can tell. There is really fantastic level design here. Don't get me wrong, but when looking at things like architecture, ambience, and in-universe lore, they don't carry the same weight. This is not a dig at the previous games. In fact, Link to the Past is one of my all-time favorite games and will always hold a special place in my heart, but objectively, Ocarina of Time really nails this concept better and had a long-lasting effect on the series as a whole. Speaking of objectivity, I'm just gonna say this as a bit of a disclaimer here, that I am biased as hell towards Ocarina of Time. Honestly, this game came out when I was just a wee child and was definitely one of the most important games of my formative years. Anyways, I've gone on long enough. You're all here for the dungeon appreciation, so here we go. Starting this little series off, let's jump into the Great Deku Tree. first level has a lot resting on it. It's a player's first impression and sets the precedent for the rest of the game. So it's important to get that first dungeon just right. Thematics, difficulty, story, teaching, these are all things that must properly be executed in order for a game's introduction to be successful. You have to sell your players on this game. I'm happy to say that Ocarina of Time accomplishes this pretty well. Now personally, I'm a fan of when a game just drops you right into the action. Breath of the Wild opens up giving you free reign over the Great Plateau. I have a video on that by the way. Which is a large wide open space to let you learn the game. Majora's Mask begins with a literal chase. A Link to the Past brings you into Hyrule Castle to rescue Zelda which sets the story up and gives you an action packed intro dungeon. And Zelda 1 just drops you into the open and says, good luck! Meanwhile, games like Twilight Princess, Skyward Sword, and Wind Waker make you sort of do your chores before you can get to the first dungeon. Literally, in Twilight Princess's case. So as for Ocarina of Time, I think it's honestly a good balance between these two styles. You're not really dropped into the action, but the tasks that you have to complete before reaching the dungeon are really just equipping yourself with a sword and shield, which is fairly unintrusive for both new players learning the controls, as well as for returning players trying to get through this section in a timely manner. I only mention this because for Ocarina of Time, the Deku Tree is still really your first impression of the game, while in a case like Twilight Princess, you may have been playing the game four hours before reaching the first dungeon, and for me, a veteran of the series, I hate that. In an otherwise stellar game, I'm here breathing a sigh of relief reaching that first dungeon and saying, oh, finally, I made it to the good part. Here in Ocarina of Time, that progression feels far more natural and you really step inside with a sense of wonder. By the way, that sense of wonder and mystery is aided further by Koji Kondo's amazing music. The man is a legend for a reason. He's a genius. The goal here was to give a more ambient, atmospheric feel, and each and every dungeon in this game really nails that. While I think the dungeon music in the game's second act is much stronger musically, 
I can't deny the mysterious vibe that this track offers. Now this dungeon is really easy, and can be completed in mere minutes by some players, but that's sort of the point here. This is the first dungeon, and for Link the first real threat he's facing, and as such there is a lot of room for forgiveness here. I don't think that it was any mistake that many of the item pickups in this dungeon are in the form of grass, which will regrow rather quickly after you cut it so that you can cut it again and get more items, rather than the clay pots that we find in so many more places throughout the game. The dungeon also has plenty of recovery hearts to find, and they aren't exactly hidden either. The enemies also mostly consist of those which are tethered in place, making them great starter enemies. Deku Babas, Deku Scrubs, even the Skulchulas, having these enemies being mostly stationary really eases players into the combat, which was especially important when this game was new because it invented lock-on targeting in 3D, so this was all very new to everybody. For new players, these enemies are simple and can't pursue you if you need to make a retreat. Meanwhile, for returning players, they're an unintrusive obstacle. Structure-wise, the dungeon is very simple. Again, ideal for new players, but without being boring for returning players. I also think that having the dungeon laid out in such a vertical structure was a very smart move to showcase how redefined Zelda as a series would be after transitioning to 3D. While not all of the game's dungeons are as strikingly vertical in their design as this one, when you're used to playing only top-down 2D Zelda, seeing this for the first time really is a great showcase that this is a new era, and while the dungeon is certainly large and open, they really guide you through the path in a linear way in order to teach you the game's mechanics. When you enter, you can see there are multiple paths before you, but you can't really pursue any of them. The hole in the floor is covered by a giant spider web, so the only path ahead is up to the second floor, where you'll find the map. If you try to climb any farther up, you'll get attacked by these wall chillas. So again, the only viable route is through the door on the second floor, through which you will find an easy to deal with Deku Scrub. You don't even have to attack him, just block his attack and he will yield. In that very next room, you'll find the game's first dungeon item, the Slingshot. Of course, you should already have the Deku Nuts and Sticks by this point, but the Slingshot is far more important as a starter item since it's going to introduce us to first person aiming in 3D space and it's going to do so in a controlled environment. This is a classic Metroid move, by the way, giving you a new item or ability and then locking you in the room, forcing you to use your new item to get out. In this case, it's simply shooting the ladder, then shooting the Walchulas in the main room to be able to actually progress further in the dungeon. This is the game easing you into slightly more difficult situations and teaching you how to use this new item without giving you a huge blatant, this is how you use the slingshot tutorial. I'm sorry, I keep bragging on Twilight Princess. I do love that game. I mean, it does give you this huge annoying text box telling you how to equip the item, which it does with every single item that you get. I'm not really a fan of that. But aside from just what buttons to press, the way it teaches you to actually use the item in application is really well done. Now that you can progress to the top floor, you'll find a fairly simple puzzle room, if you can call it that, where you'll obtain the compass. From here, the dungeon sort of shifts gears. It's taught you a lot of the basics, and it says, okay, you've got the slingshot, map, compass, you're good from here. And I like that change of pace. It's held your hand all the way up to this point and funneled you up here. And now, it forces you to think for yourself. You know that big spider web? I think placing that right by the entrance was an intentional choice as well. Because that's one of the first things you'll see in the dungeon, and so it's something that really stands out. You've also got the map and compass telling you, I mean, if you checked the map at least, you've explored everything on the top three floors, and all that you have left to explore is in the basement below the first floor. So it's not a stretch for players to have to think about how they're going to get past that spider web and down into the basement. And since the game has funneled us all the way up to the top of this huge open room, we jump. Ah! 
Thank goodness for the water to cushion our landing. The basement is really straightforward all in all. There's the illusion of branching paths in this first room once again, but you actually can't reach one of them, so there's only one way to actually go. And following this, there's a very small series of rooms with the mini puzzles. Again, staying true to the idea of making new players stop and think about operating in 3D space, while returning players can just zip through it quickly. I have always been mildly confused about how there's things like doors and operating machinery inside of Link's giant talking tree dad, but I don't know. I don't think Nintendo wants us to think about that too hard. Another thing that always bothers me is that there's this bombable wall here. Bombable walls are nothing new to Zelda, but putting it here in this dungeon before we can even get bombs forces completionists like me to return here and go to the very farthest corner of this dungeon just to get a single gold Skulltula. After making a loop through the basement rooms, you'll come back to that main water room where you fell in before, where you can now push a block to make a path to the torch, so you can easily burn that last spider web. Keep in mind, when you first entered this room and activated that torch, it specifically showed it burning a spiderweb to give you this idea that you can come back here and use fire on the spiderwebs later. Hopefully you've also been paying attention to what the Deku scrubs were telling you because you'll need to defeat these three other scrubs in the right order to get into the boss room. No big key for Little Link, unfortunately. Entering this boss room is one of those things that always stands out to me as one of those super cool moments in the game. It's cinematic in that opening cutscene, and this room really feels like a dark, dank, natural location. Which makes sense because we're pretty deep underground at this point. And the idea here that you can't see the boss when you enter while it crawls around somewhere out of sight? Childhood chills, I tell you. Yeah, the dungeon boss doesn't come out swinging like other bosses in the series as soon as you enter the room. To initiate battle, you'll have to make eye contact with Goma, which I feel pulls you into the world really well. That's immersion, you have to literally make eye contact. <laughs> Goma as a starter boss is also really great. Goma has appeared in Zelda 1 and Link's Awakening already, but her design here is her first 3D appearance and I love it. She's genuinely got a terrifying design. Who thought it was okay to make little child Link go up against this giant arachnid? Goma looks threatening and sets the mood perfectly, but overall, it's a pretty easy fight for experienced players. You can fight her on the ground okay, but when she crawls up to the ceiling, the game sets the trend of making you use the dungeon item and the skills you've learned up to this point in the boss fight. So in order to strike Goma down off the ceiling, you'll need to use your slingshot. It won't take long to defeat her, but I've always felt that this particular fight was more about laying groundwork than actually meaning to be challenging. Again, it's the first boss in the game, the first boss in all of 3D Zelda, so it's more important that this fight teaches you than it is for it to be hard. Oh, and the way her body burns away like that? I've always been a fan of that. It's gross, but in the right kind of way. After getting your heart container, which is the Zelda growth plan, you get to warp right out of the dungeon and listen to the Great Deku Tree's exposition. And then he dies. I actually really love that he gives you the creation story here before imparting the Kokiri Emerald. Again, immersion. This is all meant to pull you into the world of Hyrule, and it does it masterfully. Also, having the Deku Tree just die here is pretty important thematically for this incarnation of Link, but more on that in a later video. So overall, Inside the Great Deku Tree does its job really well. It's not Zelda's most compelling or interesting dungeon, but its goal is to be an ease of entry into the game. It teaches you without being super in your face about it all. Now people will complain about Navi and yeah. She will chime in here and there throughout the dungeon, but her dialogue here is more to support and reinforce the player rather than blatant hand-holding. She doesn't pop out and tell you to go climb that wall, but only when you approach the wall to try it does she come and confirm 
that you can. And while her telling you that yes, you can open doors is pretty obvious really, it doesn't detract from the experience in all that big of a way. So that's the start to this little series of videos I'm doing. Fittingly, the start to The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. And it's one of the all-time greats for a reason. It's timeless game design that respects players' intuition and intelligence is on full display here while they ease you into navigating a 3D space. I like it a lot. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning into this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to subscribe and stay tuned for when the next one comes out. I also just wanted to say thank you to those of you who took the time to support me on Patreon, particularly those who supported at the cheese tier or higher, which at this point includes Tetra, Callie, and Brenda. Thank you so much again, you guys, and I will catch you next time. Bye-bye.